the score for three out of five victories, as well as three out of five poles in 1985. As Indy 500 champion and defending Bud Cleveland Grand Prix champion, your mission, if you should decide to accept it, is to take your Miller American march and defend your title, putting an end to the end ready reign. And Mr. Sullivan, there's one catch. There will be over 25 other cars trying to stop you. Good luck, Mr. Sullivan. This tape will self-destruct in 10 seconds. as your number one Auto Racing Network presents Auto Racing 85. From downtown Cleveland, Ohio, on the shores of Lake Erie, we welcome you to Burke Lakefront Airport and the Budweiser Cleveland 500. Partly cloudy skies here this afternoon. It's rather breezy, but the weatherman says no rain. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, along with Larry Nuber. The 1985 CART PPG IndyCar World Series so far, Mario Andretti and Danny Sullivan. Mario with three out of five wins, and of course, Danny Sullivan, the winner of the Indianapolis 500. Well, it really has seemed like Mission Impossible sometimes this year. You know, Mario has only been beaten once this year when he has been on the track at the end of the race, and that was at the Indianapolis 500, and Sullivan had to execute that perfect spin to do it. But Mario has been very fast, and again this week, even though he's not the fastest qualifier, everybody's saying, this is the guy we got to beat. Neither Mario Andretti nor Danny Sullivan on the pole for today's race. That distinction goes to Bobby Rahal. The question is, is this Rahal's weekend? Well, a lot of people think so. You know, Ray Hall has been very fast also in the 1985 season, but those little nagging problems have kept him out of victory lane. He has won a race here at this racetrack. As a matter of fact, the Cleveland racetrack is one of those places that seems to be conducive to first-time ever winners. Guys who have won the very first race in their career took place right here. The command to start engines has been given. We have two reporters working the pit area for us today. Let's go first to Gary Lee. Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon. It was one year ago today that this color scheme, the red, white, and blue of the Domino Pizza Hot One, drove into victory lane. The driver last year was Danny Sullivan. The driver this year is Al Enzo Jr. And realistically, the team Shearson organization has had trouble finishing races early in the season. In fact, three weeks ago in Portland, team manager said to us, the strategy is simple. We simply want to finish. Al Enzo did finish second three weeks ago, and one week ago, he won in the Meadowlands. He starts seventh today. The strategy, go fast enough to win and slow enough to finish. Also with us here in the pit area is Jack Aroot. Quickness has been a key issue all week here at Cleveland, and the quickness has come, some think, from a brand new tire that's been designed by Goodyear engineers just down the road in Akron, Ohio. They're utilizing the radial design, but they've gone with a softer compound. Now, this compound will adhere better in this twisting road course conditions, and the drivers and the engineers at Goodyear feel it's a lot like an eraser. In the past, what had happened is as a racer goes across some sandpaper, it would wear off. Well, they hope the tires won't do the same now. Let's go to Bob. Thank you, gentlemen. The Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix is brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. And by Ford, who invites you to drive the new Ford Escort. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by the STP Corporation. On the world's racetracks and on the world's roads, depend on STP, your car care company. Free race activity from Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland in just a moment. Have you dreamed of Ford? When was the last time you had the kind of car to bring the road alive? Have you driven a Ford? And you don't know.
When people work, chances are they're wearing Dickies. It's the best-selling work set in America. And if you need coveralls, overalls, work gloves, socks, or shirts, footwear, headgear, underwear, or outerwear, they all have Dickies horseshoe label. Dickies are America's favorite work clothes. But who says you have to work in them? Dickies, made with Salonese for Trell polyester. Looks like you folks should get acquainted with Coleman. Coleman? The camping people? Coleman the cooler people. The people who make the Coleman cooking machine. For the patio! And Coleman canoes and boats. The son, don't forget a life jacket. That's Coleman, too. So's the tent. Now, where's Shirley? And the new ultimate lantern. Hey, this is a Coleman we never knew. Coleman, we have picture of ours. The summer's biggest sports exclusive is here on ESPN. National Sports Festival 6, the United States Olympic Committee's showcase for America's gold medalists of tomorrow, takes the spotlight for 10 straight days of live action. From volleyball and boxing to synchronized swimming, gymnastics, track and field, and more, National Sports Festival 6 has something for every fan. The celebration starts July 26th on the number one innovator in sports broadcasting, ESPN. The 28 cars in today's Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix are in their pace lap. They are at the far east end of this 2.48 mile course. Let's now take a look at the starting lineup for today's race. On the pole from Dublin, Ohio in car number three, qualifying at 131.695, the Budweiser True Sports March, Bobby Rahal. Outside of row number one, car four from Louisville, Kentucky, Danny Sullivan, the Miller Americans March. In the second row, car number one, Mario Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania in the Beatrice Lola. Outside of row number two, Jeff Brabham, car number seven in the Coors Light Silver Bullet March. Row number three from Quebec, Canada, car number 76, Jacques Villeneuve in the Canadian Tire March. Outside of row number three from Sao Paulo, Brazil in the 7-11 March, number 40, Emerson Fittipaldi. The fourth row, Al Unzer Jr. from Albuquerque, New Mexico in the Domino's Pizza Hot One, number 30. Then Bruno Giacomelli in car number 20, the SDP Oil Treatment March. In the fifth row, Michael Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, car number 99, the Electrolux Craco March, and Al Unzer Sr. from Albuquerque, New Mexico, car number five, the Pennzoil Z7. In the sixth row, Kevin Kogan from Redondo Beach, California, the number 18 Craco Wolf Systems March. Outside of row number six, Jose Legarza from Mexico City in the 55 Schaefer Machinist Union March. In the seventh row, car number 22, Raul Boisel from Brazil in the Break Free March. Outside of row number seven, car number 61 from Heartland, Wisconsin, formerly from Holland, Ari Leyendijk in the Provimi Lola. The eighth row has Roberto Guerrero and John Paul Jr. Row number nine consists of Tom Sneva and Jeff Wood. In the tenth row will be Pancho Carter, car number six, and Michael Rowe in 71. The eleventh row, Howdy Holmes in car number 33, and Jim Crawford in 34. The twelfth row, Bill Whittington in car number 12, and Scott Brayton in 37. The thirteenth row has Johnny Rutherford in car 21, and Dennis Firestone in 36. And in row number 14, is Randy Lear, car number 57, and Chet Phillip in 38. Well, Bob, this is an airport. It's an active airport, but I suggest that it really is kind of an interesting course, particularly for the spectators, because here is a road course they can see all the way around. A guy that's had his problems the last two races, crashing in uh, both of them during the race in Portland and during practice for the Meadowlands, but he's back this week, Roberto Guerrero. Well, Bob Roberto finished fifth here at Cleveland last year. I wouldn't exactly say he has fire in his eyes this week, but he really wants to make retribution. He's missed two races, or he's missed being around at the finish of two races because of crashes. He does well normally on a road course, and he'd really like to perform here today. There's the field moving through turn number nine at the far east end of the road course. This is their second pace lap, and we could be going green here in just a few minutes. 28 cars make up the starting field. Actually, 24 qualified, and the final four were added on as, as a promoter's option, including Johnny Rutherford. Well, Bob, even that it is a airport, which means you have to have very smooth runways for Indy cars, this is a rough course. It's something the crews are going to be watching today. The course could be very tough on equipment as far as the susp suspension parts go. They're at the end of the front stretch, the fastest portion of the racetrack. 
And now the field begins to accelerate, but the pace car is still out there, so we'll take one more pace lap before we get the green. This is an 88-lap race. The course is 2.48 miles in length. We anticipate a minimum of two pit stops and maybe, just maybe, three pit stops. We really don't know. We're right on the cutting edge, so to speak, of the pit stop distances. The cars can go from fuel load to fuel load. And everybody says, hey, we'd like to do this on two. We're going to start out with that intention, but it may take three. Well, we described the track for you here just a little bit. As we indicated, 2.48 miles in length. There are eight right-hand turns and four left-hand turns. The front straightaway is 100 feet wide. The back straight is 150 feet wide. And the turns are 75 feet wide. So no excuse about narrow racetrack here. They've got all the uh, area in the world to do some passing. And that, of course, is because of the fact that this uh, is normally used as runways and taxiways in an airport. I don't think that'll work, will it? <laughs> <laughs> there is the uh, look from overhead of the Goodyear blimp as it's circling above us today. Here is the way the course is laid out. Now, they have a very uh, short straightaway in which the uh, pits are located. Then a chicane turns one and two. They race down another straightaway until they come to corner number three, which is a right-hander. Then a long sweeping turn, we'll refer to as the kink. They go into the middle stretch then, then to the east end of the race course and the back 40, and then the front stretch where speeds uh, increase to about 185 miles an hour. And Bob, one other very significant characteristic of this racetrack. See that shot? You see no hills, no terrains, no valley. The course is flat as a pancake all the way around, and that does pose unique problems for drivers who are accustomed to running on road courses. There are no reference markers, no trees, no hills for you to say, oh, I need to break here, I can accelerate here. You gotta remember that. The more miles you put on this course, the better you should become because it's a course for the thinking man. You gotta remember where that reference point is. If you're lucky, maybe you'll find a rock in the road to judge by. The cars have moved through corner number 10 and are now on the front stretch, scuffing in the tires, making sure they have good adhesion there and making sure the oil temperature is up to where it should be. The, def the defending champion of this race and the last three winners, uh, Bobby Rahal, then Allen's are senior, and Danny Sullivan won here last year. Now the field comes through corner number 11, corner number 12, onto the front stretch, and the green flag comes out, and the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix is underway. Moving through the chicane down into the corner number three now. Looks like everybody got through the chicane in good shape. Danny Sullivan out accelerated Bobby Rahal as they took the flag. And right now, Danny Sullivan has the lead as the cars move onto the kink and accelerate to a speed of about 150 miles an hour at this point. Bobby Rahal is running in second position, and Mario Andretti is running third. In four spot is Jacques Villeneuve. Bob, that was our first good race of the day, I'll tell you. That drag race down into the very first corner between Sullivan and Rahal was something to behold. It was an excellent start, and somehow, I don't know how he did it, but Danny came out on top. Danny Sullivan leading now to the east end of the racetrack, going through corner number nine now. Not much of a straightaway here before going into corner number 10, then on to the front stretch. We will take a look at lap number two from the Goodyear blimp to give you an idea of just exactly how this race course is laid out. Danny Sullivan now at the end of the front stretch, braking and downshifting, going into corner number 11, now back to the left at corner number 12. There is the first lap completed. Now they move into the chicane area. That's corner number one, corner number two. There is the exit of the pit area, and that has always caused the drivers some concern because they're moving out toward the wall as the cars come out of the pits. Now they move through corner number three and onto the kink area, which is a long, sweeping right-hand corner. Speeds here reaching the second fastest that they reach on the racetrack. Now braking and downshifting, going into corner number five, which is a right-hander. Corner number six, a left-hander. Onto the middle stretch now which leads to corner number seven, which will be, again, a left-hand turn. There is Sullivan leading, and there you see the markings that indicate the runway, runway number 24. Now out of corner number nine, onto the very short portion of the racetrack, into corner number 11 once again, and now onto the front stretch. Danny Sullivan is leading here over Bobby Rahal and Mario Andretti onto the front stretch now, where the speeds really increase, about to complete lap number two. 
Well, Bob, from that excellent shot from the blimp, you can see how wide this track is. It really gives you a lot of room to maneuver, but like on all racetracks, the racing groove, the fastest groove, there's really only one of those. And if you want to move up, you've got to find another groove, the second fastest groove, to make passes. Good battle for second here. Bobby Ray Hall and Mario Andretti, and these two have raced together a time or two in the last few races. As a matter of fact, there's a bit of controversy going on between these two. It all started at the International Race of Champions in Mid-Ohio, in which Bobby Ray Hall allegedly spun Mario, and then it uh, occurred as Mario goes him. to the inside as they approach corner number five and moves into second place. Then last week there was another altercation between these two. Andretti has moved into second spot now. Ray Hall in third, and Jacques Villeneuve doing a fine job there in fourth place. Now Villeneuve also moving around Ray Hall, and Ray Hall may have a problem. Well, it's hard to say, Bob. It uh, did look pretty easy for Jacques to get around Bobby that time. Mario worked on Bobby and earned his position. Bobby continues to drift backward. Bobby apparently is slowing off of the pace, at least from the front-running cars. Bobby had big hopes for this race. He won his first IndyCar race here back in 1982 and sat on the pole for today's race, had big hopes that this would be his weekend and his string of bad luck would end. But it may have reared its ugly head again. I think in that shot, Bob, we saw that he was missing. Uh, Bill New goes by, Alan Sir Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Jeff Brabham, and Bobby is in the pit area. Bobby Rahal has come into the pit area definitely at this point in the race, an unscheduled pit stop. Tough luck for Bobby Rahal from Dublin, Ohio. He's certainly the hometown favorite here. You can see the pit crew conferring with him now. They are putting fuel into the car just to make sure that uh, it does have enough. Let's go down to Gary Lee in the pit area. Well, this stop certainly came as a surprise to the crew. I had just talked to the crew chief, Steve Horn. I said, is the car okay? He said, yes, it's a long race. We're not going to push the car right now. And now the engine has died. Bobby just killed the engine in the Budweiser March. And the crew runs down to pull him back. A crew member falls to the tarmac. They pull the car back. The inertia starter being inserted at the back of the march down. Oh, what a costly stop. Bobby is waving and... A crew member runs over to talk with him. So again, there's that question mark. The steering wheel is off, and it looks like Ray Hall is going to call it a day. Bobby Ray Hall climbs out of the Budweiser March. The field comes by and completes lap number four while Bobby Ray Hall steps from his sixth race car. It's all over for Bobby Ray Hall in the early portions of this Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Bob, that is, that is really deflating for a lot of people because this is an excellent race team and there's one fine race driver. And in talking with Steve Horn earlier this week, a lot of the problems they've had this year have been very little nagging problems. They're a kind of problems that nobody would really expect to happen. They were the same types of paraphernalia, if you will, that were on all the other cars and that are on all the other cars. But for some reason, it picked the Truman car to They'll do its damage to. They were very disappointed about what's happened up to this point, of course, in the season, but very optimistic about this weekend. And that is really a deflating moment. Well, he's only had one top 10 finish this year. That was at uh, Milwaukee when Bobby Rahal finished in ninth position. Aside from that, it's been down in the 20s as tough luck has plagued him all season long and is continuing to do so. Now Jacques Villeneuve is right behind Mario Andretti in the battle for second position. Danny Sullivan continues to lead this race. Five laps have been completed. There is Sullivan moving on to the straightaway and completing lap number five. Yeah, Villeneuve really is running a good race, Bob. And, you know, the best he's finished this year so far is at Long Beach when he finished seventh. That was the first race of the season. Uh, Jock's had uh, some minor altercations as far as spinning around the racetrack and off the racetrack, but he's a very fast racer, and this looks like a good day for him. Gary Lee is with Bobby Rahal. Bobby Rahal, you have to wonder where Lady Luck is. She certainly has not been with you this season. Well, I don't really know if Luck has anything to do with it, Gary. Uh... You know, we, uh, the clutch was uh, slipping from the word go real bad. The first time I've ever had it happen, and uh, uh, I thought it was picking the revs up a little quickly, and uh, it just kept getting worse and worse, and rather than keep running around, I came in. I mean, I knew there wasn't anything we could do, and we thought maybe we'd try to cripple around out there and see if it would get come back, but it wouldn't even get out of the pit, so that's that. So there are the words from Bobby Ray Hall, the fast qualifier, a new track record, but out of the race early. All right. Danny Sullivan is the leader with Mario Andretti running second, Jacques Villeneuve third. We'll be right back with more from Cleveland, Ohio.
just when you thought our award-winning season had done it all, ESPN's Auto Racing 85 sets new standards for excellence. Television's number one network for total motorsports coverage is taking the best and making it better. Think live auto racing, and you think ESPN. Now the Formula One circuit joins CART and NASCAR for more live action than ever before. Auto Racing 85 has something for every fan with over 60 events across the entire spectrum of speed. For a full season of high-powered, heart-stopping, spectacular thrills, it's Auto Racing 85. Taking the best and making it better on ESPN. Olympic gold medalist, Bart Connor. What a feeling it was to fulfill that dream. For me, an important stop along that road to Olympic gold was the National Sports Festival. An event of the U.S. Olympic Committee, the Sports Festival is America's centerpiece of amateur athletics. And this summer, it comes to Louisiana. July 22nd through August 4th, more than 3,000 of our best will compete in 35 sports. National Sports Festival 6 in Baton Rouge. For many, where their Olympic dream begins. Back in Cleveland, Ohio, it's basically a three-car race at this point. Early in, seven laps completed out of 88. Danny Sullivan, the leader, right behind him is Mario Andretti, and right behind him is Jacques Villeneuve. Running in fourth position is Allenzer Jr. Then in fifth spot is Emerson Fittipaldi, followed by Jeff Rabham and Ari Leyendyke. But these first three cars are running right together on the racetrack. Let's go down to Gary Lee. Well, Danny Sullivan wanted the lead early. He got the lead. Now Mario, running in second, has radioed his crew that apparently some something, water or oil, is leaking from car number four, that of Danny Sullivan. That information has been passed on to the cart officials, so let's see if Danny is black flagged. Well, we were told that, uh, and we have been watching the situation. But right now, we don't see any spray coming from that car. We'll continue to keep our eyes on it. Look at the battle for second as they go to each side of Chet Phillip to lap him. And Jacques Villeneuve has the advantage. But look at Mario going high on the racetrack between turns eight and nine to grab back second position. Good battle here. Danny Sullivan, because those two had to uh, back off a little bit to pass Chet Phillip and lap him. Danny Sullivan has lengthened his advantage just a little bit. Well, Andretti certainly didn't waste any time getting back around Jacques. I think he wants to follow Danny. This is the first consecutive lap that he's done that. First consecutive, well, working on his second consecutive, but looks like Andretti's going to park there for just a bit. Danny Sullivan from Louisville, Kentucky, the winner of the Indianapolis 500. We ask him about the pressures of being the favorite. Danny, now that seriously you are an accepted favorite every time you come to the racetrack, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Oh, I don't know whether it really works either way. It's uh, it's nice to be considered a favor, and I guess it's a little better for Miller because we get a little bit more publicity. But I think everybody's, you know, just trying just as hard every week uh, to compete, and um, I don't think it works one way or the other really for me. Sometimes the pressure's off, sometimes it's on. It's just uh, when Spinsky organization's always on. Danny Sullivan, the leader here at Cleveland in the first nine laps of this Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Back in uh, fourth position, a pretty good battle shaping up between Andretti, I think, has taken the lead, and Sullivan has slowed, Bob. Sullivan is slowing dramatically here on the front stretch. He appears to be coming in for a pit stop. The others flash by him, so two of the favorites in this race with trouble early on. Bobby Rahal is al already out with a clutch problem, and now Danny Sullivan heads for pit road. All of a sudden, that car just seemed to slow dramatically as it came off of corner number 10. Let's go down to Jackaroot. Well, it's all over for Danny Sullivan in the Miller American Racing Team. After running so strong in the early going, you heard the report from the Mario Andretti pit. Mario concerned, as we said, with the fluid leaking from the car. Well, Derek Walker just turned around after being radioed from Danny Sullivan that it was all over. He took the slice across his neck, kind of that signifying that it was all over, that there's a problem. So it looks as if it's an early afternoon for Danny Sullivan, Roger Penske, and the entire Miller American Team. 
So a third place finish at Long Beach to open the season, then a win at Indianapolis, then a fourth at Milwaukee. But since then, things have not gone well for Danny Sullivan. He was 27th at Portland. He was 18th last weekend at the Meadowlands. And now he retires early from competition here at Cleveland. Well, there is Mario Andretti, who now finds himself somewhat comfortably in the lead. Jacques Villeneuve is right behind him, though, and stalking. You saw as they were lapping the slower car of Chet Phillip a couple laps ago that Jacques got around momentarily. And you notice that Jacques has not been shaken by Mario. He continues to not only stalk, but the pressure. Now, the question becomes, and it's a little too early to tell, is Mario showing us everything that he has? Or is Jock holding back just a little bit? You really don't know unless you're inside the cockpit. Not at this point. You really uh, cannot tell who's playing the head games out there. There is Al Unzer Jr. who's running in third position. Uh, about uh, three or four seconds behind Jock Villeneuve in second. And running with uh, Al Unzer Jr. out there on the racetrack. Right behind him is Emerson Fittipaldi. Yeah, you know, Al Unzer Jr., he's becoming a specialist, really at running his own race and we've seen him do this actually since he's come up to indy type car racing and though he is running in third right now and maybe not flashing a lot of those peacock feathers of speed that we are accustomed to seeing they may be right on schedule on the race they want to run you know he's finished first and second in the last two races so until the checker flag falls this guy he may have him covered you just don't know well, he was very strong last weekend at the Meadowlands when Mario Andretti and Danny Sullivan uh, both dropped out of the race. Allenzer Jr. took control, and he held control for the rest of the way, registering his second career IndyCar win at the Meadowlands last weekend. Allenzer Jr. Emerson Fittipaldi, though, only about a car length behind him, running in fourth spot. Yeah, Emo's one of those guys who's on that long list, or relatively long list, of people that... A lot of people think maybe close to their very first win. Uh, Fittipaldi, Jeff Brabham, even Giacomelli, maybe if you stretch it, are people that everybody thinks is a real candidate sometime in the near future for winning. Well, when you register a victory, as Al Unser Jr. did last year, the question is, is the pressure of winning off? Winning that first race in 1985, I would imagine that takes off a little bit of the pressure, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, Larry. It, uh, you know, uh, it helps the team an awful lot. Uh, helps me with the team, you know, because uh, the Domino's Pizza Team Sherson won three races last year, and I won one, and, and so now we come back, and, and uh, the pressure's been off just a little bit. Al Unzer, Jr. from Albuquerque, New Mexico, currently in third position, about six seconds behind our leader, Mario Andretti. There you see Al Unser Jr. running with uh, Emerson Fittipaldi. In the pits is the number 57 of Randy Lanier. We'll be right back. Thursday, join ESPN for more live, hard-hitting boxing tournament action. Two Western Division finals are on tap. First, Victor Acosta takes on undefeated knockout artist Gary Williams for a lightweight championship berth. Then a junior welterweight slugfest. See it all live Thursday. Tonight, television's number one network for auto racing hits the strip. It's high-speed hot rod action at the IHRA Motocraft Northern Nationals tonight. Mobu One Synthetic Motor Oil. The technology behind it gives this driver engine protection he can depend on. And this driver. And this driver. And this driver. Mobile Synthetic Oil Technology. There's no finer engine protection on Earth or anywhere else. You know, when it comes to being a champion, sizes and everything, who knows better than Doug Flutie? The main thing is you gotta be tough, like this small size Ford Ranger. It packs plenty of V6 power up here. No other small V6 pickup beats it for power. And down here, there's independent front suspension. Real tough. Okay, go long. And the Ranger's cab is high and wide. Hey, do that again, Doug. What do you want, another miracle? <laughs> Fourteen laps completed in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix on the road runways and taxiways of Fork Lakefront Airport. Mario Andretti, the leader, Jacques Villeneuve running second, Al Unser Jr. is third. 
Running in fourth spot is Emerson Fittipaldi, then Jeff Rabham and Ari Leyendijk in sixth place. Let's go to Jack Aruth. I'm with Danny Sullivan, who ran so quick in the early going, and then it just stopped, Danny. What was the problem? Uh, it looks like we had some sort of a gearbox problem. Of course, it's a little early to tell until they pull it all apart, and it's unfair to blame one thing, but uh, we just lost the gearbox uh, coming onto the, the straightaway down there out of turn nine. That was that. Was that. You were so very quick, right off the drop of the green flag. You went to the front and really went after it. What's it like to the driver when it when it's all over so darn early in the afternoon? Very, very frustrating, and um, you know a little bit earlier than beer time than I wanted. But the frustrating part is that we we've been talking about you know at Portland and we were going so strong, and then at the Meadowlands to just back off and be a little bit more conservative. And uh, I was running way under the pace that if I had to push the car. And that's what's so frustrating. And then something goes and breaks, and we were being so gentle and careful and trying not to extend the lead where, where it was pushing the car too much. Just one of those things. Let me tell you guys, he did so gently through the early going, he hadn't even worked up a sweat. Let's go back up to you. All right. Well, our condolences to Danny Sullivan, but there will be a next race. I there didn't know Mario Danny. Andretti, the winner, the I leader. didn't know Danny Sullivan ever worked up a sweat. I don't think <laughs> I've ever seen him in that condition. <laughs> Well, we are right on Lake Erie here. They're about 100 yards from the actual lake itself. That creates some safety concerns, and Jack Aru takes a closer look. There's a difference between probability and possibility. Here at the Cleveland Lakefront Airport that's made into a road racing course, there is a possibility that hopefully will never become a probability. There's about 100 yards that separate the racing surface from Lake Erie itself, and should under the wildest circumstances, a car get off the road racing course, slide across the grass, and hurdle the concrete retaining barrier, it could literally dump itself into the lake. Now, Steve Edwards, the director of safety for CART, explains that there are already in place some operations and procedures to tend to that possibility. Jack, as you can see, the race line on the course actually brings the cars in a direct line with the lakefront and also in close proximity, as you pointed out. And uh, because of that, we've had to take some procedures here. We have the Cleveland Police dive boat uh, at the ready out here at all times. The water in this area is about 19 feet deep. And our program is basically that if a car does go into the water, whether it's because it's a wheel over wheel or it clears the barrier for some reason, the divers will go down immediately and try to locate the car. Hopefully, if the driver hasn't been compromised in any way, he'll already have freed himself from the cockpit and come to the surface. If for some reason he hasn't been able to do that and we have to do an extrication, we have a procedure in place where I'll suit up, I'll put on some dive gear, and I'll go down. Living in Florida, I get a lot of practice at that. And we will back a wrecker up here with a snatch block on it. We'll take a cable down and we'll drag the car out while that extrication procedure is underway. So we are prepared if, in fact, it should happen here. Now, if the driver has come out of the car, though, you still have to get him to the ambulance from the boat. The divers go in the water, and then what happens after that, Steve? Well, the divers will go in the water, and we'll be here with both of our Horton safety vehicles as well as our Horton medical unit, and I'll go in the water, too. We'll bring him out. The physicians will be here in attendance. We'll put him in our medical unit, and we'll, we'll treat whatever problems he may have at that time. So it's obvious to see that the procedures hopefully will never have to be used. But the thing that's most important is it's always better to be safe than to be sorry. Well, in the previous three races here on the lakefront, we have never had a car even coming close to going into the lake, and let's hope we never see it. We look at the first two positions, Mario Andretti being bothered, if you will, by Jacques Villeneuve. Jacques has been on Mario's tail for the last uh, 18 laps, as a matter of fact. 18 laps have been completed here in this race. Well, there's been an interesting little struggle going on for sixth position on back. Ari Leyendijk started in 14th position in this race in the Provimiville Dutch Streets number 61. There he is right there. And he has had moved his, and Ari getting a little bit out of shape there coming around turn number one, I believe that was, or turn number three. He had moved to his highest sixth position, but he's recently been passed by Michael Andretti in car number 99. There you see Michael. He's got the lap car of Dennis Firestone between him and Ari really struggling or working hard at least at this point to keep up with Michael. But one of Ari's finest performances this year, high water mark of sixth in this race. Right now he's being dogged by Jose Le Garza, who runs in eighth position, who also has run a very solid pace. Yeah, he sure has. Jose Le has done a good job. And so has Michael Andretti, that blue and yellow car that you see there. 
moving to the inside of Chet Phillip to lap. Michael had an excellent run last week at the Meadowlands and uh, has moved up now into the top ten. They battled down the front straightaway here. Michael Andretti followed by Ari Leyendijk. And now Jose Le Garza moves to the inside of Ari Leyendijk as they go into turn number 11. And Jose Le Garza moves up a position. So Ari Leyendijk is beginning to fall back just a little. He's lost two positions here in the last lap. Uh, they're really going at it. And that is Roberto Guerrero, I believe, right behind that trio. Roberto in the white car with the blue trim working on Michael Rowe. There he is. He's in the, what's that make him, ninth position. I believe and he's working these guys over too. It's been a very interesting little battle for the last three or four laps. While we watch Ari Leyendijk there's Roberto Guerrero going to the inside of Leyendijk and Ari falls back another position. We showed you a few minutes ago before we went to commercial the car of Randy Lanier in the pit area. While we watch the action out there we'll tell you that he has been restarted and has rejoined the race. Randy Lanier car number 57. Well you know it's very possible Bob and probable as a matter of fact the setup of these cars often changes from lap to lap in a particularly given race and you know the fuel now is beginning to go away the cars all started of course on full loads of fuel the car gets lighter and the setup appears to me that Lion Dyke had in the beginning which really probably was at an optimum it's gone away. Oh, a great battle for the lead as Jacques Villadouve has moved right alongside Mario Andretti. Battle for the lead here at Cleveland, and uh, Andretti falls back to second as Jacques Villadouve takes the lead. What a day for this young man from Canada. Well, you know, just across the lake, about 100 miles, there's another country, and I think that's the one he came from, isn't it, Bob? <laughs> I think you're right. Could this be another situation that where was Andretti. First, uh, Andretti just stood on the button there coming out of the corner and retakes the lead. But a great battle here shaping up. I'll tell you, Andretti does have the back 40 covered. That's where he's going around right now. It's like a box at the east end of the racetrack. There are actually three corners. It's almost like four corners. But the drivers go around a big box, maybe about a quarter mile uh, for each, each uh, straightaway there at the far east end of the racetrack. I remember when Andretti got caught behind Chet Phillip a little earlier in the day, that's where he picked up the speed and made up the time. Also at that point was going around the back 40. Well, Jacques Villeneuve, of course, has never won an IndyCar race, and we may be seeing this st string of uh, first-time winners continue here this weekend, although Jacques is in second position right now. He is staying right with the leader, Mario Andretti. We expect the first series of pit stops at about five more laps or so. We'll be right back with more as we cover live for you the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Those terrific tummies. They have no idea what some tummies are put through. From bending and binding, shaking and shifting, just to make them flat. Introducing the new Belly Burn. It can flatten your stomach. Although it looks easy, it isn't. But it works and strengthens your lower back. Order your Belly Burner today and we'll include Jim Everroad's bestseller, How to Flatten Your Stomach. I'm convinced this system is the best and quickest way to flatten your stomach. Now, if you don't agree, return it and I'll return your money. The Belly Burner, only $19.95 during this limited TV offer. It's patented, proven, and it works beautifully. Use your credit card to order. Call toll-free 1-800-255-2000. That's 1-800-255-2000. Or send check or money order for $19.95 plus $3 shipping and handling to Belly Burner. PO Box 3500, Department ESPN, West Caldwell, New Jersey. If you subscribe to the American Dream, you should subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. Every business day, the journal helps your American dream come true with complete coverage of your business, your money, and much more. Call toll-free 800-527-5300 and get six months of the journal for $56. That's $750 off the cover price. Six months, just $56. Call 800-527-5300 now for the Wall Street Journal. Sunday, ESPN presents the 46th Annual Baseball Hall of Fame Induction Ceremonies from Cooperstown. This year's honor roll includes Lou Brock, Eno Slaughter, Archie Vaughn, and Hoyt Wilhelm. They'll receive baseball's highest honor Sunday on ESPN. 
This summer from July 26th through the 4th of August, ESPN presents over 35 hours of competition from the United States Olympic Committee's National Sports Festival. The sixth edition of this event showcases America's best amateur athletes, nearly 3,000 expected to compete. Join us the 26th of July through the 4th of August for the National Sports Festival. Here at Cleveland, the race continues with 22 out of 88 laps completed. Mario Andretti has the lead, about seven-tenths of a second in second. Back in second position is Jacques Villeneuve. In third place is Allenzer Jr. Fourth, Emerson Fittipaldi. And fifth is Jeff Brabham. Two early favorites out of the race, Bobby Ray Hall and Danny Sullivan. Let's go to Gary Lee. The brain trust for these crews is here in the pit area, but the final decision obviously is made by the driver. Now, right now, Mario is said to be racing where he wants to be, at a comfortable pace. They have not admitted to it. However, Jacques Villeneuve's crew has admitted to turning the boost down. So right now, it's a case, again, of racing just fast enough to stay out in front, but racing slow enough to go the distance. Now, here with more information elsewhere in the pit area, Miss Jack Aroot. Well, Mario Andretti's crew, always with that quiet look of being very confident, has a little concern that we have to be concerned about as well. Throughout practice, and it could have been one of the reasons why he didn't qualify on the pole for this event, they had fuel pickup problems. Now, we asked the crew chief, Daryl Sapi, if they had, re had actually solved those problems before the start of this race, and he said, we think we have, but we're still going to have to wait and see. So I've got a feeling that they may be playing it a little close to the vest this afternoon. There's a lot of strategy involved in these IndyCar races and some insight there from our pit reporters on what's going on down there. Well, Bob, the other interesting thing was even though both of them apparently are holding back just a little bit, Andretti didn't want to follow him, did he? As soon as Jacques got around, Mario disposed him and went right back to the lead. Yeah, but at the same time, even if the boost is turned down on that Villeneuve car, he's impressive because, as you can see, he's falling back just a little, but by and large, he's staying right with Mario Andretti, at least keeping him in sight so that uh, when things develop, why Jacques will be right there. Michael Rowe has come in for a pit stop. Now, we're beginning to see regular pit stops, but this is not one of those because, as you can see, they're taking the side pot off and they are uh, working on that car on the right side of it, so not a scheduled pit stop for Michael Rowe. The engine is shut off in that car. Well, Bob, as we mentioned at the top of the show, two, three pit stops, we really won't know until we see how it goes. The normal pit stop should take place uh, in a lap or two between laps 25 and 30. Now, if somebody can go as many as 29 laps, It'll be very close if that first stop is any indication. But if they can go 29 laps, they may be able to go the distance, 88 laps, on just two pit stops. That's the load of fuel that starts the race, the second load in the mid part of the race, and then a final load or third load on the second pit stop. So lap 29 is what to keep in mind. Anybody who goes 29 laps or more, they are a bona fide candidate to go the distance on just two stops. So Mario Andretti continues to be the leader here at Cleveland. As we take a look at some of the boats that are parked uh, just beyond the backstretch here, great place to watch the race from, and besides that, you don't have to pay to get in. <laughs> you know, Bob, Andretti, it's probably overwork, but it's, it's certainly worth citing again. The guy is really amazing. He makes race driving look relatively easy. It's so very difficult. You can see Mario there, the 17th IndyCar road course wins. He's number one on the all-time list. It's very difficult to be consistent in a race car because everybody is out there trying their hardest. And if you make one mistake on one part of the course, you lose momentum, and that is such a critical word in driving a race car. And the rest of the field has a tendency to catch up or has that opportunity to catch up. But Andretti, week after week, race after race, lap after lap, he just goes out there and cranks them off. Now, sometimes he looks a little spectacular, but he's still very steady. He is really amazing that a guy can go out week after week and perform like this. Yeah, he really is an amazing guy. Last weekend at uh, the Meadowlands when he had that little incident with Bobby Ray Hall, and, you know, it's just one of those racing accidents, but... It's, it seems like it's something like that that takes Andretti out of a race nowadays. As, aside from uh, running into a problem on the racetrack, the car has stood up well all year, and uh, naturally Mario has been up front. Well, as we said at the top of the show, only once this year has he not won a race that he finished, and that was at Indianapolis. Well, Villeneuve continues to hold pace and 
Andretti leads this race, and Villeneuve, you cannot see him in the shot right there. There he is just at the top of the screen for a moment there. He's still within striking distance, and Michael Rowe has stopped. And our shot here from the blimp, uh, I think that's out on the back 40, Bob. Well, Michael Rowe, of course, was in for a pit stop. We showed you that. They were uh, making some kind of adjustment, and he went back out there on the track, but has stalled. Looks like it's in the corner number nine at the extreme east end of the racetrack. Raul Boisel is in for pit stop. This is the car that owned by Dick Simon. Boisel has performed well in his races this year on the Park PPG IndyCar World Series. Quick pit stop, and Boisel is back out there in competition. That's lap 27, so probably planned uh, real quickly here, as quick as we can. Uh, Andretti Villeneuve, third, Alan Sir Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Jeff Brabham, the top five before these first series of pit stops coming up. Michael Andretti, sixth, uh, Jose Lee Garza, then Roberto Guerrero, Ari Loyendijk, Bruno Giacomelli, Alan Sir Sr., Tom Sneva. Sneva's come from 17. Uh, Kevin Kogan and Jeff Wood in car number 27 doing an excellent job. And there is Bruno Giacomelli who's come in for a pit stop. They're changing the rubber on the right rear of the car. Allenzer Sr. is also in for a stop in that bright yellow Penske car. That car down off the jacks and now moving back out onto the racetrack as is Bruno Giacomelli. And Jimmy Crawford has come in, the Scotsman who lives in Lee Summit, Missouri. He says he's found a home there. There's Howdy Holmes. He's pulled in and that blue and white car near the top of your screen. And I think that's Jacques Villeneuve who's in the pits now. I think you're right. Indeed it is Jacques Villeneuve. Here's Gary Lee. The crew is over the wall. They're changing at least three tires as Larry Curry and company go to work on Jacques Villeneuve. They're planning to make only two pit stops today. They're very happy with the fuel consumption. Larry Curry said Not a bad stop for Jacques Villeneuve. He blasts back out there on the racetrack. About a 20.7 second pit stop for him. And now we see if Mario Andretti will be coming in for a stop. There is the number 99 uh, Michael Andretti in. Changing rubber on that car. And here is Scott Brayton, it appears, stalled on the race course. Yeah, maybe that's a fuel problem. Just a guess, but that's on the long straightaway. That's the last flat spot, the last straightaway before you go into the pits. You know, because this racetrack is so flat, you can't really push the fuel. If you run out of gas or run out of uh, methanol alcohol somewhere on the racetrack, chances are good you won't get around because there's nowhere to coast. Well, they'll have to bring one of the safety vehicles out now and get that car off the racetrack. Mario Andretti stays out there, however, about to complete. He has just completed, as a matter of fact, lap number 29, moving through corner number three now. We have had no overall yellows to this point. We are on a road course, of, uh, naturally, and the yellow flag is displayed in the area of the racetrack that the problem is in. If it's a serious situation, then they'll go overall yellow. Emerson Fittipaldi is in for a pit stop. They changed the right rear on that car. In fact, both rear tires and fill it up with fuel. Well, Bob, you know this pit stop, this fuel consumption situation. Fittipaldi and Andretti are the only two. And <laughs> Emmo really fighting that thing like a fucking Bronco getting out of the pit lane there. But that's routine, I guess, for a former two-time world champion. Anyway, back to this fuel consumption thing as Emmo checks his mirrors and goes back into the fray. Fittipaldi and Andretti are the only two guys who have really shown the ability to go the distance on two loads of fuel. Now, everybody else may have come in as a precautionary measure, cut it short by one or two laps, and maybe in checking their fuel consumption rate, they can assure themselves that they're going to go the distance. But I remind you that only Fittipaldi and Andretti have proven it by going 29 or 30 laps. Everybody else looks like they might be cutting it short. Well, Andretti has already completed lap number 30 and is now over on the Lake Erie side of the racetrack. So he's going to complete at least 31 laps before he comes in for a pit stop. We get confirmation that uh, the number 37 car of Scott Brayton off of the course between turns 9 and 10. Well, here's Mario coming through that back 40. Remember, this is the far east end of the racetrack, turns 8, 9, and 10. Uh, after he executes the final right-hander, turn number 10, then he gets to the fastest part of the racetrack. See the airplanes in the background. If he's going to pit, he'll pull off to the left coming down here. He'll slow down and go into the pit area. And no, it doesn't look like it. He's staying out there for even one more lap. What did this be, Bob? Like 42? 
this will be he's completing lap number 31 32, now, 31 so. 32 this time around there he goes around Bruno Giacomelli it's pretty amazing that he can stay out there for that length of time without coming in for a pit stop Emerson Fittipaldi and Jeff Brabham are out there on the racetrack battling for fifth and sixth position right now Brabham in fifth and Fittipaldi in sixth spot. Well, Jeff was one of the leaders, at least among the top five leaders, who pitted early. Uh, he came in unofficially about lap 23, lap 24. And uh, Brabham right now running a little uh, stronger pace than what Emmo is. Yeah, Emerson uh, dropping back there just momentarily as Roberto Guerrero goes around in corner number three. Moving once again toward the kink, turn number four area of the racetrack, the long right-hander. I think this Week. is Pancho Carter on the screen right now. Pancho did make the field here this weekend at Cleveland. You know, it's a, been a real struggle for him. He did some special testing out of Laguna Seca this week to continue to refine those road race driving skills. Now let's see if Mario comes in for a stop this time. Is. Yes, he is. He's staying high on the front stretch, and that means he is headed for the pit area. Jack Aroot is in the Mario Andretti pit and set to call this pit stop. Jack? They've slowed him down he comes and hits the marks right on the spot the Beatrice crew goes to work Mario Andretti takes a drink and this is the first time in almost a year that Mario's required liquid refreshment during a pit stop mid Ohio was the last time they're tending to the tires they've made the exchange waiting for the fuel to vent out it does they disconnect and they drop the jacks and he's off and away well, it was a 19.1 second pit stop, so just about a second faster, a little more than a second faster than Jacques Villeneuve stopped. Now, as he comes out onto the race course, we'll see how they are on the track itself. By the way, uh, Jose Le Garza has not come in for a pit stop, being shown in uh, the lead right now, but he will have to have a stop before long. And ready, moving off of corner number three. Breaking into corner number four as we have our shot from overhead in the Goodyear blimp. I think unofficially Jose Lee did come in, but Mario certainly has the advantage. All right, we'll be back with more from Burke Lake for an airport of the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix in just a moment. Have you lineup is packed with action. Speed Week sets the pace with auto racing's best highlights and biggest headliners. Then, our summer sports exclusive gets underway. Preview 10 days of live National Sports Festival coverage and meet tomorrow's Olympic stars. Then, top-ranked boxing comes at you live from Las Vegas. ESPN's junior welterweight and lightweight tournament Western Division finals pack plenty of fun. All Thursday on your source for sports. From overhead, the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise from Pompano Beach, Florida, at the controls this afternoon, Pat Henry from Parsons, West Virginia. What a great view of Lake Burke Lakefront Airport here in Cleveland, where today the Budweiser Grand Prix is being conducted, and what a tremendous uh, event this is for the city of Cleveland. Great response from the public here and from the uh, local news media. It's really a thrill to come to uh, Cleveland and see this uh, Grand Prix every year. The top six at this point, Mario Andretti, the leader. Jacques Villeneuve running in second position, about 18 seconds behind. Jeff Brabham is third, about 23 seconds behind. In fourth position is Emerson Fittipaldi. Fifth spot is Alanzer Jr. Jose Legarza has made his pit stop and comes out in sixth spot. 
Bob on officially uh, Al Unser senior moves up to seventh Ari Leyendai holds fourth in eighth Michael Andretti is ninth Bruno Giacomelli 10th Tom Sneva 11th and Roberto Guerrero in 12th great pit stop for Jeff Brabham by the way there is Ari Leyendai on the right hand side of your screen at the top is Al Unser senior they're looking at seventh and eighth position Leyendai having a great ride today and Al Unser senior coming off the wake of just a tremendous pit stop he went into the pits on officially about 11th or 12th position and comes out in seventh. Well, Al Unser Sr. is having a tremendous year as far as that is concerned. He, of course, is a substitute driver, more or less, for Rick Mears, who still is not able to compete on the road courses. The feet have just not healed to uh, his liking. It's a lot of work for Rick Mears to work the clutch and, and shift the gears. So Al Unser Sr. is subbing for Rick Mears, but I'll tell you what, he's done a tremendous job. There's a shot of Ari Leyendyke running in seventh spot. Isn't that amazing about Al Unser Sr.? There he is in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. This guy didn't even expect to drive any more than three races this year, and here we are about the one-third point of the season, and he is a definite championship threat. And the way he drives, finishing is so important as you head toward that championship. I'll tell you, he's more than a threat. He's a real candidate. Ari Leyendijk, formerly from Os Holland, of course, uh, got his most of his experience here in the United States in Super Bs and has joined the IndyCar ranks full-time this year for the Provini team. Well, Loyendike has gotten Al back, so that moves Loyendike back up to seventh. Al Sr. into eighth. He caught a quick glimpse of Michael Andretti and Bruno Giacomelli. That's how close the ninth and tenth place cars are to the seventh and eighth place cars. So a potential ensuing interesting battle there between the seventh and tenth place cars. You also got a quick glimpse of a red and yellow car. Now that looks like the car. There it is in the far right hand side of your screen that Derek Daly drove in Indianapolis. That's being piloted by Jeff Wood today. That is the former Caps writer sponsored Lola. Uh, right now the sponsorship money isn't rolling in as has been promised. So Jeff has a, well, I guess he's a substitute driver today also for that car. Not a finish out of the top 10 when he has competed. Allen's her senior this year. He did not compete at Milwaukee. Rick handled the oval chores there. But a fifth at Long Beach, a fourth at Indianapolis, a fourth at Portland, and a third last weekend at the Meadowlands. He qualified 10th fastest here. And a little bit earlier, we had an opportunity to talk to Al Unzer Sr. I don't know that the designated hitter has ever won a batting title, but you've been the designated hitter on the road courses this season for your teammate over here, and now you're in the points chase. Would you like to have that ride uh, full time? You're going to try to talk him out of it? Well, let's just see what happens. Uh, when he's ready to come back, uh, I would rather have him have the car, you know, because it, it's not good to take somebody's place like that, especially somebody as, as bad as he is. <laughs> Did he say bad as he Oh, is? he couldn't have said that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek there. Both of them are very gracious about the situation. It's very much a wait-and-see attitude on both behalf of Rick as well as Al Unser Sr., and they're both saying, well, let's see how it goes. But, you know, the period of that subject is, of course, that the Penske team can easily field three cars if it wants to. Saw briefly there the Scott Brayton car, which has been moved behind the barrier, and your speculation was correct, Larry. Brayton did run out of fuel, just literally feet from the entrance to the pits, but nevertheless, that car is uh, off into the grass now and out of the race. Yeah, the other thing about this road course, uh, this course here at Cleveland, it's not particularly safe to go out and return a car now all he did if our reports are right is run out of gas and under normal circumstances maybe you could go out and the safety crews could retrieve the car but because of the layout here it's just not safe to do that so it might be an abbreviated day for the man who holds the one lap track record at the indianapolis motor speedway 38 laps are completed 88 will make up this budweiser cleveland grand prix indy car race and the leader is Mario Andretti. Running in second position is Jacques Villeneuve. The separation between first and second, just about 12 seconds now, as Andretti had just a little bit better pit stop than did Jacques Villeneuve, and he had built up a little bit of a lead besides that. In third position now is car number seven, driven by Jeff Brabham. There we continue to watch Al Unser Sr., who is running in eighth position. Now ESPN and CART present a track fact.
travel from racetrack to racetrack on the kart series, one of the problems is the inconsistency of the terrain where your car is assigned as a garage area of sorts. Well, the Penske Miller Racing Team has come up with an answer to that problem, and that's this surface plate. What this does is maintains a level area of terrain at every racetrack that they go to. And it's very important when you're trying to set up an Indianapolis car. Important for suspension and ground clearance. This track fact has been brought to you by Levi Garrett Chewing Tobacco. Time after time, the quality comes through. So at Cleveland, the leader is Mario Andretti, followed by Villeneuve, Brabham, Unzer, and Fittipaldi. We'll be back in just a moment. ESPN's August sizzles with live sports excitement. The driving force hits high gear with four NASCAR thrillers, three Formula One Grand Prix circuit showdowns, plus Hart, IMSA, and IHRA drags heat. The National Sports Festival sparkles with more drama from August's biggest sports exclusive. And there's live international tennis on tap with Davis Cup quarterfinal competition from West Germany, the Men's Canadian Open, and more. August kicks off another season of exclusive live CFA Saturday Night Football, while television's best golf coverage continues with PGA Championship, Buick Open, and LPGA National Pro-Am play all live. The Total Sports Promise delivers hard-hitting regulars PKA Karate, top-ranked boxing, and Wednesday night PBA bowling action. August harnesses more live horsepower at the Hamiltonian, and there's hard-driving motocross excitement in the picture. Stay hooked on Saltwater Journal, fit with Yalad, and informed with SportsCenter. The total sports temperatures rising in August on ESPN. Back at Cleveland, Ohio, on the Budweiser Grand Prix, we recap the halfway point for you. Bobby Rahal was the pole sitter in this race at 131.695, breaking the previous track record by about five miles an hour. Outside of row number one was Danny Sullivan, the Indianapolis 500 winner for 1985. Unfortunately, though, it was an early out for both of those cars. The average speed of 124.991 miles an hour at the halfway point. We have had three leaders and three lead changes. Danny Sullivan led laps one through nine, then Mario Andretti, 10 through 44. Out of the race so far, Bobby Rahal, Danny Sullivan, Scott Brayton out, so is Bill Whittington, Michael Rowe, and Jeff Wood. All of those retirees in the first half of this race. Now, the top 10 as we have them. Mario Andretti leading Jacques Villeneuve, running second, about 13 seconds behind now. Jeff Brabham is third, Allenzer Jr. fourth, Emerson Fittipaldi fifth. Six through 10, Ari Leyendijk, Jose Le Garza, Allenzer Sr., Michael Andretti, and Bruno Giacomelli. This Coney Midrace recap has been brought to you by Coney, makers of shock absorbers and suspension kits for all performance cars. Coney, proven superior. Every one of the operators here is getting ready to take your order for the best sounding offer Time Magazine has ever made. Part of it is right here in my hand. But first, watch this, and I'll be back to show you the rest. You like to keep up with what's going on in the world, don't you? You bet. Well, if you call this toll-free number, you get Time Magazine for more than 40% off the cover price. Sounds good to me. I'll take it. Uh-uh. I'm not through. You actually get that discount for over half a year. 27 issues. So you know what's going on in the world. In the nation, with politics, interesting people, the latest movies, your health and technology. With all the color and insight that only Time can deliver. That's for me. I'll take it. Wait. You get Time's eagerly awaited Man of the Year special and Images 85 with the year's most memorable pictures. Great. I'll call. Not so fast. Wait till you see this. What? The official Statue of Liberty pin. It's yours, free. Terrific. I'll call. Hold on. You haven't seen your other free gift. you got to be kidding. No, we're not. It's Time's Micro FM headset radio. Also free with your paid subscription. Remarkably compact, but with great reception and big, high-fidelity sound. I'll take it. Wait a minute. It comes complete with hideaway headphones and carrying case. All free. And all you have to do is call 1-800-221-3200. Now? Now. That's time for more than 40% off, including the two special issues and a free Statue of Liberty pin, 
and a free micro headset radio with headphones and case, all for four easy payments of just seven forty-nine. Hello? I'll take it. Hi, I'm Jenny here at Time Magazine. Didn't I tell you it was a great offer? Time at over 40% off the cover price and the two special issues, plus the Statue of Liberty pen and the incredible micro headset radio. They're both yours, free. But call now. I can't hold on to this offer much longer. What a lineup of auto racing during the month of August. 11 big events scheduled for you here in the United States. Larry and I and Jack and Gary concerned mostly with the NASCAR Spark Plug 400, the Bush 500, Darlington 500, also the IndyCar races at, at, uh, at Pocono and also at Elkhart Lake. But overseas, the Austrian Grand Prix and the Dutch Grand Prix will headline our Formula One coverage with Jackie Stewart. We certainly do believe it is among the most complete on television, and without a doubt, we certainly have more races than anybody else. Mario Andretti is the leader here, and the battle for fifth, sixth, and seventh out there involving Ari Leyendike, Jeff Brabham, and the number 55 of Jose Le Garza. There is Brabham and Garza right there. And there you see this line as they move to the east end of the race course. Well, it's a little confusing from that angle because they're moving through slower traffic. I think that's John Paul Jr. They're trying to tiptoe the way around. Lion Dyke is leading that group. By the way, the rundown on this, Jeff Brabham, you recall, was running in third position. He had to make a stop for a tire change a couple of laps ago. He lost two positions. He lost out to Alan Jr. and to Emerson Fittipaldi. And that's why he has dropped back to this battle for fifth, sixth, and seventh. That white car, number nine, right there is Roberto Guerrero. He is not in that battle, although he runs competitively with those guys. He's seen most of this quartet of drivers for all of this race, but Roberto has made at least one extra stop. He came in twice during the 20-lap uh, interval, the 20, 30-lap, 10-lap uh, segment, and he came in once about two laps ago. So he is laps down, although he races on the racetrack with this group. He's in 14th, unofficially, uh, a lap down. Roberto Guerrero, Jeff Rabham there running in the sixth position. There are uh, still about 10 cars on the lead lap at this point, and the mathematics figures out that Mario Andretti is getting 2.2 miles per gallon. Now, you must get 1.8 miles per gallon in order to have enough fuel to finish as uh, Rabham passed there by Michael Andretti. So Andretti is getting uh, much better fuel mileage than it takes to uh, to win this race, and he even has enough uh, boost that he can turn it up a little bit more if he needs to. Yeah, that certainly is handsome mileage, I must say. And as we mentioned earlier, with the distance that he went on that first full load of fuel, no problem, obviously. He is the one who can go the distance. There is Michael Andretti now working on uh, Roberto Guerrero. Remember, again, Guerrero is down laps, but Michael has really been coming on strong here the last couple of laps. Yeah, he has. He's uh, now moved up into unofficially sixth position. We anticipate a stop by Jacques Villeneuve, another pit stop, his second of the afternoon uh, in about six more laps. We'll keep our eye on that. We're watching Roberto Guerrero, followed by Michael Andretti, and then Jeff Rabham. Andretti moving to the inside of Guerrero in corner number 11 and 12, and Andretti passes easily in corner number 12, and now Jeff Rabham oh, moving to the inside. Oh, three abreast on the front stretch. Oh, momentarily there. Now well, they all move into single file formation, though, to go into corners one and two, so no problem. Yeah, like we said at Portland, you can't go through chicanes uh, too abreast. All the IndyCar drivers do it now and then, but you can't do it, right? And the last lap, Michael Andretti, uh, in the last two laps, let's put it, Michael Andretti has moved up two positions. He is now in sixth spot. So Andretti continuing the good performance that he turned in last week at the Meadowlands. And there you saw just how close the pleasure boats can get to parts of this course as they watch this battle with you for positions from fifth on back. And it's been a good one. These guys have been together all race long. It's been clean, it's been fast, and it's been very interesting. Well, here on the front stretch, last lap, we had three cars crossing the finish line side by side, and the question was, was everybody going to make it through corners one and two? And they sure, did. Sure, <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> Good three of breast racing, though. Well, Jose Lee saw a hole he shot for it. It was a matter that he was down in the bottom side of the racetrack, and you know that word we mentioned earlier, momentum? He just didn't have enough of it to carry him into the corner. Jeff held his line and went through very smoothly. Michael Andretti running in sixth position, and Jeff Rabham back in seventh. 
seventh and eighth spot is the number 55 of Jose Legarza. There they are coming down the uh, straightaway here out of corner number two. Right, right behind them is Allen's or senior. He also is on the same lap. So that is sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Meanwhile, we have uh, another battle shaping up here between Jacques Villeneuve and Al Unzer Jr. for second spot as Little Al has caught Jacques. He certainly has, and Little Al now begins to put the pressure on Jacques Villeneuve. Remember, we told you earlier in the race that Al is very good at driving his own race, and apparently has come time to charge, or at least at this point of the race, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the condition of the race car. He goes to the inside of Villeneuve, Ooh. and Al Unzer Jr. has the runner-up spot. Nice move. He uh, just waited for the opportunity moved to the inside and passed momentarily but Villeneuve out accelerates him down this uh, kink area now once again to the inside it is Alan Sir Jr. moving into second position wow that's nasty oh and Jock Villeneuve is spinning. is spinning in corner number four rather corner number six Jacques Villeneuve does a complete spin keeps the engine going and moves out but he loses second spot well, that's one of the situations on a road course. Yes, you are running against other competitors, but you're also racing against the track. And in a, tr a track like this, when you don't have all those reference points, you've got to remember, you've got to pay attention. And I think the racetrack jumped up and got Jacques that time. He was paying just a little bit too much attention to Al Unser Jr. and not enough to the racetrack. Here's a replay of it. Moving through corner number six, the rear end on the number 76 right car gets just a little out of shape. Well, that's one of the advantages to running a track like this. He can spin all the way around. He's got a little room to maneuver, a little bit of room to get out of shape. Drop her back down on the first and pull away and take off like nothing happened. Nobody was watching, right? <laughs> Only us. Yes. Tom Sneva has also spun and stalled on the race course, asking for some assistance from the corner workers and from the cart officials so that he can get restarted. Tom Sneva stalled on the race course with 56 laps completed now. And now Allenzer Jr. with about a 14-second deficit trying to catch up with Mario Andretti. We'll be right back with more from Cleveland. Introducing an amazing new tool designed to help you work in those hard-to-get-at spots that conventional tools can't. The Cricket. The versatile Cricket is a ratchet screwdriver as well as a ratchet wrench. In those hard-to-get-at tight spots where other wrenches won't work, the amazing Cricket at Squeeze Ratchet Action does the job with ease, saving time, temper, and skin knuckles. No more impossible jobs, not with the Cricket. It features a reversible push-through drive, turning power six times the gripping force. Can be used with any standard Dometric 3 8 inch socket and much, much more. Solidly made in America of high alloy steel with lifetime guarantee. If you order today, not only receive the incredible Cricket, but for a limited time only, also receive five slotted screwdriver bits, five Phillips bits, a quarter-inch drive socket adapter, and an anvil that adapts to any 3 8 inch drive, plus a sturdy storage box. All 14 pieces, only $19.99. To order your 14-piece Cricket ratchet set with a lifetime guarantee and Made in America quality, use your credit card for rush delivery by calling toll-free 1-800-331-1000. Or send check or money order for only $19.99 plus $3 shipping and handling to Cricket Ratchet, P.O. Box 3500, Department A, West Called Jersey. ESPN's Auto Racing 85 today in Cleveland, Ohio for the sixth stop on the PPG IndyCar World Series. The Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix is being brought to you by Rust-Oleum Paint and new Rust-Oleum Auto Care products. Nobody fights rust like Rust-Oleum. And by Goodyear, makers of the high-performance radio, the Eagle. And by Pennzoil Motor Oil, quality protection. Ask for it. With 59 laps completed in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix, the leader is Mario Andretti with a 20-second lead over Al Unzer Jr. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. Ari Leyendijk is fourth. Jeff Brabham is in fifth. In sixth position is Jose Legarza. And sixth, although he is falling back, Jacques Villeneuve. Now Villeneuve ran second, spun, and he has been dropping back since then. We expect him in for a pit stop at any moment. Those seven cars on the lead lap in eighth position, a lap down, is Al Unser Sr., then the number 99 of Michael Andretti and Bruno Giacomello. Giacomelli. And we understand that the number 76 up, Villeneuve, is in the pit area. Yeah, Bobby came in after that spin because undoubtedly the tires were flat spotted. He feels very racy, very fast, so he wanted to get back up to speed. But he came in approximately on lap number 
58, which may have been too soon. He may be cutting it too short on the other end here for that second load of fuel to carry him to the end of the race. Now, the point to keep in mind here is about lap 60, 61. If most people can go 60 or 61 laps, they probably can go the rest of the distance in this race on this next load of fuel. Let's go to Jack Aru, who has some observations on Mario Andretti's outstanding performance so far. Well, the one thing that they've already determined down here in the Beatrice team, that in two laps they're going to pit for what should be the final time. They've already elected. They figured out their fuel mileage, and their, their fuel consumption is at 2.2 miles per gallon. So they feel that if they can go two more laps, they can go the distance and make it on two pit stops. So that's the word from the Beatrice crew, and that would make them a little bit stronger than the rest of the competition because Al Unser Jr. has already been in and out of the pits. Yeah, it would certainly put them in a very advantageous position as far as pit stops are concerned. We'll continue to watch that situation. Andretti has been leading this race since lap number 10. Bob, is, is that fair? I mean, can you be the fastest car plus get the best fuel mileage too? <laughs> well, that seems to be the situation here. It certainly does. I tell you, that really is incredible that he can be that fast, be that smooth, but still also be getting what appears to us up here to be the best mileage of everybody out there. At least he's timed for the best because he's gone more laps than anybody else on both loads of the fuel so far in this race. Andretti nearing corner number five now, a right-hander, then back to the left and into the middle stretch, nearing the east end portion of the racetrack. Mario Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, who has won three out of five races this year on the Kart PPG IndyCar World Series. Last weekend, his only race that he has not completed, and he was involved in an altercation with Bobby Ray Hall and Jeff Rabham last weekend that sent him to the sidelines. Mario Andretti. Well, Mario won six times in the 1984 season en route to the championship. When we visited Cleveland last year, he had only won twice so far, so he's well ahead of uh, the 1984 pace. There you saw him just putting a lap, I believe, on Jacques Villeneuve. And even though Villeneuve has pitted, admitted now he has more fuel than Mario, which makes the car much heavier. Villeneuve seems to be significantly off the pace that he was setting, oh, gee, just about five laps earlier when he was in that little uh, tussle there with Al Unser Jr. He has fallen a lap down. That means that we now have six cars on the lead lap. Mario Andretti, 45 years of age. He is by far and away the leader in the point standings so far this year. Last year here at Cleveland, he dropped out with an ignition problem and was given a 21st finishing position. Today is his 257th IndyCar start. I don't think I've driven a store that many times. <laughs> He's been in that many IndyCar races. And as far as wins are concerned, he has a 63% winning percentage on the ovals and a 37% winning percentage on the road courses. Not bad. We're anticipating a pit stop by Andretti soon. Uh, will it be this lap? You can see the crew is waiting for him. They are poised. Just Dennis Firestone does come in for the stop, but Mario Andretti stays out there and completes lap number 63. So he'll go at least 64 laps before he comes in for a stop. I don't know, Bob. I'll tell you, these guys obviously know much better than I do, particularly Mario. He's been driving race cars since before I started driving cars. But... With this size of lead, I don't know that I'd push it. They've already established the fact that they can go the distance on the next load of fuel, so I think I would have had a tendency to come in and pit that time around, but they normally know best, but I'll really be shocked that they choose to not come in this time because this will be lap number 64, more than enough to go the rest of the distance. Well, they, of course, have all kinds of calculators uh, determining the fuel mileage, and, of course, there always is the uh, red light that comes on indicating that the car is low on fuel. But Mario Andretti is still staying out there, and the crew, once again, waiting for Mario to come in. We'll see if it happens this lap. Well, right now he's uh, nearing the east end of the racetrack. Oh, he's around the east end already. He's coming around already down the front stretch, and now he's pitting this time. All right, Mario Andretti into the pits for his second scheduled stop of the afternoon. Let's see how things go. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, now, one of the key things that the crew will do, and they've determined already, they're not going to take a full load of fuel. They're going to go with a time stop, just take enough to go the distance. The reason for this is the continuing possible problem of fuel pickup. They've determined that that occurs when it goes down too low. They've taken the full fuel load. They're off and away in 
2.8 seconds. Poetry in motion, the only way to describe that. Just yeah. total uh, coordination on everyone's part. That may have been the checkered flag. I'm not sure. We've got about <laughs> 45 minutes of racing to go, yeah. but the thing is pretty good right now. Yeah, anything can happen, of course. Something can go wrong with the car, and of course, there's always a possibility of an off-road excursion, but for right now, Mario Andretti is the dominant force here at Cleveland. Back with more after these messages. Thursday, ESPN Speed Week is your source for all the latest motorsports news and highlights. It's a fast-paced half hour of thrills. Thursday. Got to get up! Got to get away! It's time to Mustang! It's a Mustang kind of day! Got the feeling! Feeling in the right mood! Got a Mustang! Mustang attitude! One shock absorber is so superior, it has been used by every world champion for 13 consecutive years. Kony. Kony. So superior, they're standard on every Ferrari, on every Aston Martin, on Mustang SVO. Kony. The ultimate performance shock. Adjustable for wear. Guaranteed for life. Less body lean. More stability. Crisper handling. Put the world's finest performance shocks on your car. Kony. Proven superior. Just when you thought our award-winning season had done it all, ESPN's Auto Racing 85 sets new standards for excellence. Television's number one network for total motorsports coverage is taking the best and making it better. Think live auto racing and you think ESPN. Now the Formula One circuit joins CART and NASCAR for more live action than ever before. Auto Racing 85 has something for every fan with over 60 events across the entire spectrum of speed. For a full season of high-powered, heart-stopping, spectacular thrills, it's Auto Racing 85. We're taking the best and making it better on ESPN. Far overhead, the Goodyear blimp showing us Burke Lakefront Airport. A beautiful setting and a great place to watch a race from, regardless of whether it's in the stands or on a boat. Generally, a waterfront view of motor racing is reserved for European racing in the Formula One Grand Prix Circus when they stop off at Monaco on the French Riviera. But with the advent of temporary racing facilities like Detroit and here at Cleveland, the boating community gets a chance to watch racing right from their own boats. With us today is the skipper of the War Eagle, and we're out here on Lake Erie, Frank Miller. Frank, the boaters really do enjoy the racing out here when it comes to town, don't they? They sure do. They'll be packed out here before the day is over. Is there anything in particular that the boaters look for from this vantage point that we may miss in the grandstands? I don't believe so. They have a beautiful view from out here. It's too bad they couldn't get the revenue from, by charging them for uh, admission. <laughs> Well, I can tell you one thing. It's certainly a lot different watching racing from here than my normal vantage point in the pits. And, Bob, let me tell you something. Watching a race from a boat is marvelous. Simply marvelous. Back to you. Jack, I must say that you get all the uh, easy assignments. That's where he was all afternoon yesterday, huh? Was Trying that, to do that. That, that was Jack Aroot? Yeah. I thought that was somebody else who just looked like him Boy, for a while. what a life yeah. he leads. I know. Well, <laughs> Howdy Holmes has uh, spun off the course and may have had contact with a barrier. The workers are working with him, trying to get him unstrapped and out of that car. Howdy appears to be okay, but it's all over for Howdy Holmes on this Sunday afternoon. And that's a rare occasion, particularly in 1985. He's finished four of the first five races. There is Jose Le Garza, who runs in the top five. He was yeah, he unofficially was second. in second. Yeah, he's had a great day. He's been very fast, very consistent. And now they're in for their second and final pit stop. And away with seemingly no problem. Jose Le Garza going back out onto the racetrack. 67 laps have been completed. Mario just completing lap number 67. He's the leader. 42.9 seconds is the separation between himself now and the second place, Al Unzer Jr. Mario Andretti, a dominant 
four so far in this race, but of course anything can happen. And we will be back with more of our live coverage from Burke Lakefront Airport and the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Stay with us. What Barron's is, is the investor's guide to finance, the markets, and the economy. You are listening to Alan Abelson, editor of Barron's, the national business and financial weekly from Dow Jones. We provide our readers with insight into the markets, tell them what things mean. We're out to inform and enlighten, and if we entertain you in the process, why, that's just fine. Barron sees things about the market that most other people don't. And when we spot them, we tell you about them. We don't hold back. We tell you the good news, and we warn you when you might get hurt. Get the next 26 weeks of Barron's for $39. Order today, and you'll also get as a bonus Barron's exclusive booklet to help you with your market forecasting. That's 26 weeks of Barron's plus the bonus booklet for just $39. Call 800-554-9000. That's 800-554-9000. We want our readers to be smart about their money. It's as simple as that. Revco's world-class women brought to you by Revco Discount Drug. Life in the fast lane of sports has translated into success for golfer Patty Sheehan. From 1981's Rookie of the Year to 1983's Player of the Year, Patty's consistence has earned for her more than $700,000. Patty also sponsors a home for abused children in San Jose, California. For world-class women, I'm Randy Hall. Catch the action of Revco's world-class women right here on ESPN. There is Dennis Firestone, who has just jumped out of his car. He's sitting on the barrier near turn number two. There was a huge puff of smoke that came from that car as he crossed the finish line, and he just simply parked the car in turn number two. He's out. He's okay, but Dennis Firestone is the most recent retiree. Now let's take a look at the 1985 finishes. Mario Andretti has won three times and has four top five finishes. Fittipaldi hasn't won a race, but has been in the top five three times. Alanzer Sr. has not won, but has been in the top five four times. Sullivan is a winner this year and three top five finishes. And Al Unser Jr., the winner most recently at the Meadowlands and two top five finishes. The point standings in the battle for the PPG Cup. Mario Andretti with 82, far ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi in second place with 51. Al Unser Sr. is third with 48, then Danny Sullivan with 47, and Al Unser Jr., fifth. Sixth position, Tom Sneva, then Roberto Guerrero, Kevin Kogan, Michael Andretti, and tenth in the point standings with 16, Jim Crawford. By the way, if Mario Andretti can win this race here this afternoon, he'll pick up the lion's share of the purse and make about $49,000 for his efforts here today. Andretti the leader with about a 45-second lead now on Al Unser Jr. There are six cars in the lead lap. Jose Le Garza, because of that most recent pit stop, is now in seventh position to lap down. In sixth is Ari Leyendijk. Fifth is Al Unser Sr. Fourth is... Jacques Villeneuve, third is Jeff Rabham, and in second position is now Unser Jr. Well, Andretti is working his way through top ten cars, putting laps on them. There he went around Ari Lewandyke. Just an update on some of the other people running near the top, by the way, as we watch Andretti. He's that bright red car, of course. Emerson Fittipaldi's car has sounded like a very sick popcorn popper the last couple times by here on the front stretch. It's not funny to Emmo because he's had a nice solid top five going all day, but it doesn't sound like that car is going to finish. And Jeff Brabham, who had to make that premature pit stop, remember, has moved in on Al Unser Jr. And as a matter of fact, as we talk about it, there they are. There's Al Unser Jr. And is that him? Has he gotten around Brabham? Uh, uh, yes, he has. Yes. Are, uh, correct no, that. Al Unser Sr. Right. Jr. still in second with Brabham running in third spot, but right behind him in the battle for second spot. Absolutely. And Jeff has moved in the last two or three laps. He continues to run nice and smooth since that pit stop. Moving into corner number two now. By the way, you saw a few minutes ago, Andretti now has lapped Ari Oh, there goes Jeff. And Jeff makes the move on Little Al in corner number three and moves into second spot. That was pretty slick. Little Al moved out to take a good viewpoint, it looks like, going around Raul Boizo. And as he did, Jeff went around, and now Al gets it. <laughs> no, that's Al passing Raul. Both cars look just about the same on our monitor from up here. 
Brabham has moved into second position. Brabham started this race in fourth spot, qualifying at 129.493 miles an hour. Jeff Brabham, formerly from Australia, now making his home in San Clemente, California. He's 33 years of age. Last year here at Cleveland, he finished the race running in eighth position. This is his 45th IndyCar start. Well, you've really got to chalk this one up as a successful day for the course car. You know, the idea obviously is to finish, but this is the strongest that Jeff has run, even in the middle of the race for quite some time. He does have a sixth place earlier this season at Long Beach, but this could be his finest hour today. Let's go down to Jack Aroot, who's in the Jeff Rabham pit. You're looking at something that most pit crews don't wish to have in their tanks at this point. Extra fuel. It's not extra for Jeff Brabham, and this is his tank, because he's going to have to come in, as you said, Larry and Bob, and take on additional fuel. It'll be a quick gas and go, but it could cost him a couple of spots in the finish. Yeah, it probably will at that. We'll be watching for that situation to develop in a few more laps. Well, it's kind of interesting to think that, you know, Jeff, Rick Gallus, and the crew, they're all dialed into what's happening, too. Uh, so what's going on? Is they are treating every lap like the last one. He is going all out. He is going as hard as he can every time around. He would like to build up as much of a cushion as he possibly can over himself and the rest of the field, with the exception of Andretti, who was way out front, of course, so that when he makes that quick stop, maybe, just maybe, if all things fall into his hand, he could get out and not lose a position. But as Jack indicated, the possibility of that happening is pretty slim. His best finish of 1985, a sixth at the Long Beach Grand Prix. Jeff Rabbit. Back with more from Cleveland, Ohio, after these messages. When Isuzu said they wanted a memorable commercial for 8.6% truck financing, I said, I'm your man. 8.6 on 86 Isuzu trucks. 8.6 on 86 Isuzu trucks. 8.6 on 86 Isuzu trucks. Oh, yeah. Got to show the product. There. Whoa! I knew I was the man. Vista Isuzu is unloading trucks now at low 8.6% financing. It has been recently estimated that within the next few years, there will be over 50 million video cassette recorders in use. Who will repair them? American Video Repair Institute now offers this challenging profession to those who can see the future today. Go to your phone and call now, 818-898-1496, because the video cassette repair technician sees job security and financial independence in the future. American Video Repair Institute. Classes are limited, so call now. This is the STP Inside Track Report, brought to you by the STP Corporation. On the world's racetracks and on the world's roads depend on STP, your car care company. The talk in the pit area and in the garage area here at Cleveland this weekend, the recently announced rules package for CART for 1986 and the next four years. The purpose of the package, to slow the cars down by reducing downforce and to afford the driver more protection. Now, the cars will be lengthened by four inches, and the cars will be strengthened in the front end. The side pods will be maintained. In fact, a minimum width has been established. Wind tunnel exits will be narrowed to reduce the downforce, and the rear wing will be raised. This is to increase the driver's ability to see out his mirrors. As it stands right now, the view is obstructed. Well, this is the fourth race here at Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland, the first under the promotion of Roger Penske. There is a lot of talk, however, that the cars will not return to this facility next year. Well, Larry, ask Roger about that. This race, next year, there have been a lot of conversations about, oh, where it might go. Some people say, oh, I know where it is going, but actually, you're the guy who makes that decision. What about the Cleveland 500 Cleveland Grand Prix? Where is it headed for next year? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is have a successful event in 1985. And so far, the the people in the city of Cleveland, uh, Mayor Voinovich, uh, Council President Forbes, these people have been terrific. They've really worked with us. Uh, uh, the whole community has gotten behind this event, and that's what it's going to take. I never realized how great it is to work at a racetrack when you're so close to a major metropolitan area and the, and the opportunities that you have, really. I think that uh, the Cleveland race is going to be one that will be here for a long time and i'm just glad to be part of it uh, i didn't realize in january or february that i would be but because of our background and experience we've had at michigan our people have come in here and so far so good so i'm counting on being back i hope that everyone else is too 
the Cart B Series is officially dead at least for 1985. The long-awaited Lotus IndyCar may be ready for testing and could make its debut on a road course later this year. Chip Ganassi may be involved as the driver. A couple of new motors may be ready for the Cart IndyCar World Series next year. Mario Andretti said to be involved in a new second-generation Cosworth. And the Renault motor, which has been under development for the last couple of years, may be ready for testing with either Team Shearson or True Sports involved. And a bit of a surprise at the Daytona Firecracker 400 last Thursday. In an experimental car, Greg Sachs walked off with a victory over Bill Elliott. And that's this week's STP Inside Track Report. We'll be back with more racing from Cleveland in just a moment. ESPN's exclusive live coverage of the PBA Summer Tour continues tonight. $125,000 is on the line at the Austin Open right here. Okay, gang, let's take on the tough stuff. Only one four-wheel drive vehicle has this combination of style and toughness, the Ford Bronco 2. Inside, there's an interior by Eddie Bauer. Up front, a V6 engine powers you through rough terrain. Underneath, Ford's tough independent front suspension steps over obstacles for a smooth ride. Overall, the Ford Bronco 2 not only conquers the rough stuff, but looks good doing it. Ford Bronco 2, the best built American trucks are built. Ford tough. If you subscribe to the American dream, you are a dreamer until your dreams come true. You should subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. Then you're a leader, and they're all looking up to you. You have the courage to see your dreams through. The dreamer, the leader, they're one and the same in you. Every business day, the Journal helps your American dream come true. With business news, financial news, facts, trends, ideas. Everything in the world that affects your world. Call toll-free 800-554-9000 and get six months of the journal for $56. That's $750 off the cover price. Six months, just $56. Call 800-554-9000 now for the Wall Street Journal. The Daily Diary of the American Dream. Bob Jenkins, Larry Newber, Jack Arood, and Gary Lee back at Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland, Ohio for the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. We're high atop the grandstand here near the start-finish line, and we hope you're enjoying our coverage of this race here this afternoon. We have 79 laps completed, so we have less than 10 to go, and Poncho Carter is getting a tow back to the pit area. He spun off the course down uh, near turn number 10 and is being towed back to the pit area. Pancho Carter, the pole sitter for this year's Indy 500. Now the top five at this point. Mario Andretti, the leader, with a 40-second lead over Al Unser, Jr. Jeff Brabham is third, Jacques Villeneuve fourth, and Al Unser, Sr. is in fifth position. And those five cars are the only ones on the lead lap, and Mario is about to pass Al Unser, Sr. Jeff Brabham, by the way, uh, while we were taking care of some other business, has come in for that extra pit stop that we all anticipated. He got out of the pits uh, about 10 seconds behind Al Unser Jr. We've got a little more than 10 laps to go, so it still could be a very interesting contest for the runner-up position. All the work is done in the pits. Well, the pits have been an interesting place this afternoon. Not a whole lot of action down there, but let's uh, check in with our reporters. First, going to Jack Aroot. Gentlemen, again, I'm just so impressed with this brain trust behind me. The Beatrice Racing Team have literally made it a cakewalk, seemingly a cakewalk. Now remember, they've had the problem with the potential fuel pickup, and now they've encountered another problem on the car, but it doesn't seem to concern them. Mario Andretti just two laps ago radioed in that he'd lost third gear, but they're still going away out front in the Cleveland Grand Prix, and it looks like the Beatrice team may, and I repeat may, come home a winner again. For some more observations from Pitt Road, let's go to my colleague, and that's Gary Lee. Well, Jack, this is very reminiscent of three weeks ago in Portland when it was Andretti out in front and Al Jr. chasing in second position. Before the race today, I talked with Doug Shearson, the team owner for the car driven by Al Unser Jr., and he said, I'd be very happy to finish in the top three. We've had trouble earlier this season finishing. Right now, we can finish. We'd like to get some points. So today, it may be second place for Team Shearson. Bob? 
All right, thank you, Gary. Not too far away from here is Municipal Stadium, where the Cleveland Indians are playing baseball this afternoon, and their opponent, the Chicago White Sox. More people on hand here for this IndyCar race, though. We're covering it live for you, and we'll be back in just a moment. In 1914, an Isuzu demonstrated its speed by racing a horse. Unfortunately, the horse won. Today, the turbocharged Isuzu Impulse is one of the fastest GT cars in the world. Isuzu, in 1914, we lost the first car race in Japan. Today, we're getting even. See the racy new Turbo Impulse sports car at Vista Isuzu in Woodland Hills. You all know about Saturday night racing at Saugus Speedway. Well, now we've added Fridays, too, and the action is just as exciting. To top it off, Friday admissions are reduced, so bring the whole family. First and third Fridays, claimer races. Second and fourth Fridays, it's pro carts on a tough road course with European turns and short straightaways. Join in the fun every Friday night at 8 o'clock. Just take 5 north to the Valencia Boulevard exit. Make a right three and a quarter miles, and you're here at the Saugus Speedway, the super track. There's the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise from Pompano Beach, Florida. The pilot this afternoon from Parsons, West Virginia, is Pat Hendry. And normally this would be an area where that blimp could land, an airport. But the runways and the taxiways are being used as a road course today for the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Stop number six of the PPG IndyCar World Series. By way of recap, Mario Andretti is the leader, about a 36-second lead on Al Unser Jr. He took the lead on lap number 10, has held it ever since. We've completed 83 now, and we only have five more laps to go. Bobby Rahal was the first out of the race with a clutch problem. Danny Sullivan dropped out shortly after that with a transmission problem. There have been no serious accidents during this race. A couple of drivers have spun off course, including Pancho Carter and Howdy Holmes, but it's been a very safe race to this point. On the racetrack, running in 11th position, car number 20, Bruno Giacomelli. Andretti has slowed, Bob. I don't know if it was a matter of just uh, Ari Luendijk getting the advantage going through the first corner, but he definitely slowed down. And now there's oh, fire there's coming fire. out of the top of the car. Mario heading off course. I think the day is over for the Beatrice Lola. You're absolutely right. He's taken the escape course, and there is fire coming from the top of that race car. And he has pulled... Uh, away from the fire truck it is approaching him right now and will be there momentarily it doesn't look like that mario is in any danger whatsoever but he is waving to the fire trucks to come and assist him and get the fire out mario andretti's day is over and he will not be the winner of the budweiser cleveland grand prix well he had pop coming down the front stretch just as he was beginning to decelerate for turn number one it is and on fire yeah the burn is quite healthy at this point it looked like, like it was right on the top of the block. Uh, it's not where you fill the fuel. It was right off the top of the engine compartment, so no way of knowing at this point exactly what happened. But it did make a noise, almost like a miniature explosion. Now we have an interesting situation that's developed here. Al Unser Jr. is the leader of this race, and there he is. However, we have been noticing in the last few laps, Jeff Brabham closing in on him. The question is, does Jeff have enough time to catch him? The interval is about five seconds between Al Unser Jr. and Jeff Brabham, and now less than four laps to go. Bob, here is a very interesting scenario. With 10 laps to go, it was a 10-second difference. There you see Jeff. You saw Al Jr. go by about four seconds ago, as Bob indicated. Jeff is closing at a pace of one second per lap, but there is only, what, four or five to go. Well, this completes lap oh, 85, 85. Well, so we've only go. got three to go, yeah. And it's going to take uh, another miracle, it looks like, for Jeff Rappin to win this race. But we could have a two-time winner. In fact, two consecutive race wins for Al Unser Jr. You know, Bob, I was about to say that the attrition had not been too brutal today. It attacked Bobby Rahal and Danny Sullivan, the two front row cars, the early part of this race. But it's been a good day for a lot of people. And until that lap, obviously a good day for Carl Haas, Paul Newman, Mario Andretti, Daryl Sopi and crew. But people like Jacques Villeneuve, Ari Lewandyke, uh, Jose Lee Garza, Michael Andretti, they've had good days today. There have been a number of teams that would chalk this one up as a success. 
And another very interesting uh, finisher in this race is going to be Al Unser Sr. He has now moved up to fourth position and his phenomenal season as a substitute driver continues. Not only has he moved up to fourth position, but just think how many points he stands to pick up. I'm telling you, the guy is more than just a candidate. He's a threat for the championship. We're talking about Al Unser Sr., he is, uh, of course, a winner of this race. You saw the interval between first and second position, and it looks like too healthy a one for uh, Jeff Brabham to overcome. Yeah, I think Al Unser Jr. is going faster now. He must have gone to the downhill direction, you know, <laughs> because the lap seems to be going by much too fast for Jeff Brabham. But Brabham, boy, with that extra pit stop, just think, that bad tire, apparently what he had was the difference between winning and losing today. Here's the problem that Mario Andretti ran into just as he crossed the start finish line, a pop from the engine and fire coming from the top of the race car. And Mario used an escape route to pull the car off of the racetrack and retire from competition. And it didn't snuff out either until the emergency crews got over there. The car would not uh, suck out its own fire. It needed help externally to get the flames out. So Mario Andretti led laps 10 through 84 but just after crossing the finish line for that lap he dropped out and Al Unser Jr. has gone into the lead and now is less than two laps from a victory and Michael Andretti has ducked into the pits here late on I'll bet you it's fuel that's just a guess because he's been running in the top 10 uh, he did stop for his two regular pit stops Lap 28 and lap uh, 49 uh, make that lap uh, 58. So this one was probably one they just missed their calculations by just a tad. Well, the white flag has come out, and this is the final lap of the race. Al Unser Jr. from Albuquerque, New Mexico, is about to win his second consecutive IndyCar race. He is in turn number six now onto the middle stretch. Less than a half lap to go now for Little Al. Jeff Brabham, by the way, has slowed down just a little bit, so he is going to be content at least for the moment for this runner-up spot. And Jacques Villeneuve continues to motor around out there. It looks like he's destined to get third. Great performance for the young Canadian. Well, it's going to be another uh, Unser reunion in victory lane, it looks like, as son is going to win the race, and it looks like that dad is going to come in fourth position. Here comes Al Unser Jr. at the end of the front stretch. Now breaking and downshifting into turner number 11. Turn number 12 crosses the finish line, and Al Unser Jr. wins. There's the winning pit crew for Al Unser Jr. and Jeff Brabham's Rick Gallus pit now looks for their driver to come through corner. And Jeff, and Jeff is, coasting. is coasting. He is just coasting across the finish line, but does do so and winds up in second spot. Just a guess, but they sloshed in probably just enough fuel to go the distance, and I'd say that they predicted accurately. They just <laughs> made it. Now we see that Al Unser Sr. has passed Jock Villeneuve, and Al Unser Sr. finishes third. And Jock Villeneuve, Villeneuve back to fourth, and Villeneuve limps across the finish line. So we usually take the first three finishers up onto the winner's platform, and two of the three are going to be Unser's just like last weekend. Just a guess. When we told you at the top of the show, it could be very, very close on the fuel, and I'll bet that Brabham on the right, Villeneuve on the left, you see him sitting there. It's not a parking lot. That's a makeshift victory lane for the top four finishers. Finishers. That's probably what happened to them. Finishing in fifth spot is going to be Ari Leyendijk. Then unofficially, uh, Jose Le Garza in sixth. Michael Andretti may finish in seventh position, although we'll have to check that because he did make that late pit stop. Others that might finish in the top ten include Emerson Fittipaldi and Kevin Kogan and Bruno Giacomelli. There's your winner, though, Al Unser Jr. We'll be back to talk with him in just a moment. Improved formula, new vinyl. The remarkable clear vinyl liquid that protects and beautifies almost everything made of vinyl, leather, and rubber challenged the competition and won. Yes, in tough detergent tests by an independent laboratory, new vinyl lasted more than three times longer than these two competing brands. And new vinyl is easier to apply. Unlike the other brands, there's no waiting, no rubbing, no buffing. Simply wipe it on. In just minutes, your car's vinyl top can look showroom new. New vinyl is not a wax. It's a space-age polymer that actually penetrates and bonds. So it always remains flexible, won't crack or peel. New vinyl's improved formula also gives longer-lasting beauty and protection to your car's tires, upholstery, dashboard, motorcycle seats, furniture, shoes, purses, luggage, almost everything made of vinyl, leather, and rubber. 
so get improved new vinyl. There's no other formula like it. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Improved formula new vinyl in 8-ounce or new 16-ounce spray bottle. Available at these fine stores. Just when you thought our award-winning season had done it all, ESPN's Auto Racing 85 sets new standards for excellence. Television's number one network for total motorsports coverage is taking the best and making it better. Think live auto racing, and you think ESPN. Now the Formula One circuit joins CART and NASCAR for more live action than ever before. Auto Racing 85 has something for every fan with over 60 events across the entire spectrum of speed. For a full season of high-powered, heart-stopping, spectacular thrills, it's Auto Racing 85. We're taking the best and making it better on ESPN. It's a happy Al Unser Jr. in victory lane. He's won the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Let's go to the winner's circle right now. All Al, right, Doug. <laughs> Al, congratulations. An incredible win. Your owner, Doug Shearson, as you pulled into victory lane, said, I can't believe it, two in a row, and let out a war hoop. <laughs> I can't believe it either. You know, uh, we were running there in second, and then all of a sudden, the, the board says P1 on it, and I see Mario smoking over there, and I just went, all right, you know. <laughs> Uh, is it is it hard to k maintain your poise near the end? It, it, there had to be a period there where maybe you thought, well, I'm going to settle for second place. Well, no, you know, there was no time that, that we were going to settle for, for second place. It was just, uh, uh, you know, we we put on, we, we broke the car in qualifying yesterday, and, and I didn't get to run the final session, so I had to put on brand new tires on my last pit stop, and they were great for about seven laps, and then they just went off real bad and and i was fighting to hold third you know i couldn't i couldn't hold jeff grab him off and and uh you know i was we knew he had to make one more pit stop but uh you know it's just it's unbelievable uh, uh, i'll tell you the thing that's unbelievable <laughs> two in a row now for your team owner doug shearson he's won two here at cleveland you won at meadowlands last week now you've won here everybody talks about mario andretti when are they going to start talking about al Unser jr are we seeing a changing in the guard we're seeing a change in the guard, definitely. You know, I just uh, I want to thank all my my sponsors, Domino's Pizza, Coke, Mobile, and Bosch. Everybody just uh, if it wasn't for them, we couldn't be here today. And and we're on a roll. And I just hope the roll just keeps on rolling. If we're not mistaken, this would be the first race that a father won. He won it a while back, and now a son has won. How does that make you feel? Uh, it makes me feel great. You know, I just I'm glad to be where I'm at, and and you know, just driving hard all day. Uh, I was wondering when I was going to start winning those first couple years, and, and now we're just backing into them, so I just hope it keeps going. <laughs> Al, congratulations, and gentlemen, I can guarantee you there's going to be some heavy partying going on tonight. I'll bet that's right. Thank you, Jack. Congratulations to Al Unser, Jr. Well, our Winter Circle interview has been brought to you by Goodyear. Goodyear tires and Goodyear service for more good years in your car. Well, the crowd begins to file out here as the party boats continue to be in Lake Erie. We'll be right back with some post-race comments in a moment. This is the northern part of America's heartland, Elkhart Lake in the middle of Wisconsin. Population 1,000, but thousands...